During the coronavirus crisis. It's going to be a very difficult time. We all have payroll, we have taxes, we have insurance, we have rent. An increased sense of loneliness, stress, worries because of all of the different nude sources. As the state reopens, your questions answered in a statewide virtual town hall. If we don't come together, we all fail each other in a sense. From business leaders, health leaders, and state leaders. Our goal was to cause the most damage possible to the virus while doing the least possible damage to our businesses. Live across the Palmetto State, a COVID-19 special report. South Carolina responds. Your questions answered. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. This is South Carolina Responds, Your Questions Answered. It's a statewide town hall on COVID-19 and our response to it. I'm Gordon Dill in Spartanburg, joined by colleagues Amy Wood in Greenville, Brendan Clark in Charleston, and Megan Miller in Myrtle Beach. Our COVID-19 town hall is live on six Nexstar broadcasting stations across the state. We'll be answering questions from you, our viewers, from the upstate to the low country and the PD. Tonight, we're joined by Governor Henry McMaster, Senators Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott. They'll answer the questions about the state and federal response to the pandemic. And state epidemiologist Dr. Linda Bell is covering your health care questions, along with Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman, who will join us to talk about what is ahead for our schools. But we want to begin in Charleston with Brendan Clark, who got to sit down with the man leading South Carolina's response to COVID-19. Uh, that's right. Good evening, Amy. Sitting down one on one with Governor Henry McMaster at the State House. I did that yesterday. We talked about how we got here, where we are going from unemployment and the economy to education and what we have learned the last three months. Governor, when did you know uh, COVID-19 was going to be a problem? When was that moment you, you said to yourself, this is going to be bad? Well, we were watching it on television and in the news, just like everybody else. But Come early March, uh, that, that's when we, we were for sure we knew that we were going to have some real dislocations in South Carolina. It was clear as a bell by that time. And although Governor McMaster was one of the last in the country to issue a stay at home order and beaches and retail stores opened days after the state experienced one of its highest number of new positive COVID-19 tests, McMaster said he'd do nothing differently. What would you say to a person who has said that you are playing with the lives of South Carolinians. I think we did it just right. We have, as you know, a great team. We got a lot of information from different places, including the science and the data. And I think uh, our whole team thinks that we, we did it just right. We, we didn't shut down as quickly or as deeply as some others did. Some others went too far, too fast. Some others were too late. I think we did ours just right. And I think we're coming out of it right. And the numbers that we're seeing seemed to indicate that we did the right thing. And you remember Dr. Fauci the other day uh, said that he, he wished he could clone South Carolina's response. So that's, that's pretty good, uh, an indication of how we did. But the governor quick to point out this crisis isn't over yet, not by a long shot. Just as aggressively as we fought this virus as it was coming at us, now we're chasing it with testing and tracking and all of that as we open up. But we're going to have to be just as vigorous in watching our social distancing as we're going to be vigorous in reopening these businesses. We have a new thing to do in South Carolina and the rest of the country, and that's to be on guard and take protective measures against this virus, which is going to be with us for a while. You've been quoted as saying the state's economy should be humming by the end of June. Yes. Uh, you still think that's realistic? Yes. I think that the people of our state are ready to get going. Uh, we've removed those restrictions uh, that we had. Now, we had no restrictions on Boeing and BMW and Volvo and all of those. A lot of, and we didn't close down hospitals, we didn't close down hotels, but a lot of uh, different industries and businesses, because of the environment, they, they closed things or restricted them themselves. And the group that we've put together called Accelerate SC has 30 members that have wide fields of, of overlapping knowledge all of, of, about South Carolina life, are given a lot of guidance and information on exactly what to do and how to do it and when to do it. And we, we're, taking, we're taking that advice and making a, we think, a very careful, measured reentry into the marketplace where we can accelerate our economy and at the same time, be very, very careful and safe. 
But many warn as states reopen, there is the threat of a so-called second wave of this virus, even as we still battle the first wave. But this wave is not over yet. We're doing a lot more testing. We're going to find out there are a lot more people that people go keep getting the virus. But if if we're not careful, we could be in big trouble because once you go through a, a sort of a depression like we've had where everything is slowing down and then it's revving up again, it is very difficult to to turn that back around. So that's why we are urging people. We're saying that out, we're, we're, on the, we're on the rebound. Our state is opening up. People are ready to get to work and ready to get going. But they must have as a part of their lives for the foreseeable future the understanding that this virus will get you if you do not take care. And if you have it and give it to somebody else, uh, you will regret that for the rest of your life. And coming up in the next half hour, more on my conversation with Governor Henry McMaster. I asked him about the problems people are having receiving their unemployment benefits. We talk about when students will be back in the classroom and our health care system. The answers to those questions coming up at around 730. Gordon, back to you in the so upstate. much ground to cover, Brendan. Thank you for that. We've also had a ton of questions from you about the federal government's response to COVID-19. We're joined now by South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham. Standing by live in D.C. for us tonight. Senator Graham, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, this is a really good idea. Thanks for having this program. Well, we, we do have a, a lot to get through here, but I have to start by asking the question we are asked more than any other in our newsroom. It's about those direct stimulus payments that were sent to people all over this right. country. Should people have gotten their check by now? And what do people do if they still don't have their money? Well, you can call my office, but yeah, you should have it by now. Uh, if you have an account where you pay taxes or receive a tax refund, it should have been deposited in that account. If you hadn't filed an income tax in a while, you're still eligible. You could be on disability with no income and still get the payment. So just think about what we did. We gave everybody in the country a $1,200 check. Uh, a family of four would be like over $3,000. Uh, that's a major league task. We shut the entire country down and tried to give everybody made under uh, $70,000, $75,000, a $1,200 check, and we're getting there, and the money is needed. Will, will there be more? I mean, is the Senate already working on anything to give additional payments to that you know, nearly, what, 15% of people who are still out of work? Well, I want to focus on the people out of work. The best thing to do is get the economy going. I think uh, Governor McMaster has done it right. In June, I hope we have a lot of businesses open. There's no substitute for a job. We've got hundreds of thousands of people in South Carolina who are laid off. We have a $600 federal benefit on top of state unemployment. You make $924 a week if you're unemployed in South Carolina. Uh, that runs out in July. My hope is that we'll have a job available for you uh, come the end of July, and we won't need to extend this benefit. From an area you know well this evening, Senator, let's take a question from one of our viewers in Central South Carolina. Hey, I'm Michael Sager, and I live in Central South Carolina, and I was just wondering if you guys have a plan in place for if there's a second wave of the virus. Senator, a second wave. Is there already a plan in place? Absolutely. What do we need to have if there's a second wave? And there will be. We need to have a lot of uh, personal protective equipment. I've got legislation that will require our uh, personal protection equipment for doctors and nurses to be made in America, not China. Uh, the Milligan Company is making three million hospital gowns in Pendleton. My, my goal is to get all the medical supply chain back into the United States so we won't have to depend on China. Let's get the drug vaccines and therapies back in the United States. We've got plenty of hospital capability. A second wave, we should be much better prepared. And the goal is to get drug therapies that keep you out of the hospital, that lessen the effect on the human body. We should have that by the fall, and hopefully by the fall, we should have a vaccine in the making to kill this thing. So I think we'll be much better prepared in the fall. Did you say you, there will be a second wave in the fall? Is that what I heard you say? I think, I think you can almost count on it. These viruses have a history. COVID-19 mimics other COVID viruses. I'll be surprised if in the fall we don't have a return of the virus, but we should 
be much better prepared. We'll build up our PPE for our doctors, our nurses. We'll have plenty of hospital beds. Uh, we'll be much better prepared on the drug front. We have drug therapies that are lessening the effect on the human body. That should all be in place hopefully by the fall. And sometime later in the year, the end of the year, beginning next year, hope to have a vaccine to kill this thing. So you can almost for sure it will come back, but we'll be much better prepared. All right, let's take another question from a viewer. This one uh, also from the upstate. My name is Courtney Copeland. I'm from Spartanburg, South Carolina. My question is, why didn't we have anything uh, already prepared in case something like this happened, especially with all the other viruses that we experienced over the previous years, the Ebola, the H1N1, all those things. So why didn't we kind of learn from those uh, viruses and go ahead and prepare if something else were to come? Senator, should we have been better prepared when this happened well, in this country? That's really a great question. They call this a novel virus because it's novel. It came out of China. This is the third uh, uh, pandemic to come out of China. Uh, we think it came from a bat where it came from one of these wet markets where they consume bats uh, along with other products in the human food chain. We don't know yet if it came out of a lab, but the personal protective equipment has been offshored. We weren't as prepared as we should have been. I think by the fall, we'll have a handle on the medical supply chain made in the USA. Uh, drug therapies are very promising to lessen the effect on the, on the virus. You can blame the Obama administration, you can blame the Trump administration, you can blame me, but the whole world has had a problem with this. This has taken the world by storm. The group I want to blame above all else is China. They withheld information about the virus, they had told us the truth about it. We could have gotten a grip on it a long time ago, but we are where we are, and I feel much better about combating the virus in the fall. I think we're turning the corner. The economy is beginning to reopen. I think we're going to be in a very good shape in the fall. Senator, i got about 30 seconds here. I just want to clarify one more time. Okay. Is the Senate going to pass some other bill to provide more financial relief for South Carolina? Yes, but it won't be Nancy Pelosi's $3 trillion package, but there will be some more money for individuals, businesses, and the state. But we've got to figure out how we spent phase three before we do phase four. But I think there will be a phase four, yes. All right, that is Senator Lindsey Graham joining us live from Washington, D.C. this evening. Senator Graham, thank you. thank you for your time this evening. We're also going to check in tonight with Senator Tim Scott a little bit later in this hour. But up next, we're going to talk health. State epidemiologist Dr. Linda Bell will join us. You're watching South Carolina Responds, your questions answered. We'll be right back.
South Carolina Responds. Your questions answered continues now. And welcome back. So many of you have important questions about the science of this virus and how it spreads. I'm joined right now by South Carolina's state epidemiologist, Dr. Linda Bell. She's in Columbia this evening. Dr. Bell, first, thank you for joining us. And we want to talk a little bit about a follow up to Senator Lindsey Graham saying he is expecting a resurgence in the fall. Uh, from your perspective, watching the trends, the numbers and the behavior of viruses like this one, what do you expect? Well, um, this is a novel virus and we don't have a lot to compare it to. There are similar viruses, coronaviruses that have previously appeared, uh, creating limited outbreaks, but this one has been widespread and ongoing. And so we do fully expect the possibility that we'll continue to see transmission through the, through the fall and that it could potentially worsen along with other respiratory diseases that will also be tr uh, transmitted during the fall and the winter months, including the, uh, the seasonal flu. So it's really best that we make sure that we have um, everything prepared for that possibility. Um, as Senator Graham mentioned, with the availability of personal protective equipment, hospital preparedness, but in addition to that, making sure that our disease surveillance systems are ready to detect new outbreaks and new occurrences and hot spots of the virus so that we can rapidly respond and continue to implement prevention and control measures if we see the virus increasing. One of the big questions we've received from dozens and dozens of teachers is how will this play out in the schools? If we do have a resurgence, if students are physically present in classrooms, once someone is infected and you do all of this contact tracing, et cetera, how does that play out in the school setting? We know that we are really going to be looking at a new normal in every aspect of our lives, businesses, in the communities, and in schools in particular, um, regardless of what level that is. Uh, the nature of the schools is to bring children together, and uh, the fact that, they, uh, that that plan, the way it exists now, is to have them in close proximity. So we will continue to work with the Department of Education and schools to advise them on the appropriate guidance to maintain as much as possible social distancing. We're also making recommendations for the schools to make sure that parents are aware of what to look for, that they don't send children to school who are ill, that staff members don't show up for work who are ill, and that schools have a way of monitoring children. Uh, we're not suggesting that they take temperatures or anything like that, but that there's a system in place to monitor for the possibility of illness so that anyone who's ill in a school setting can quickly be um, excluded from that setting so that uh, transmission doesn't go on. But um, there are additional measures making sure there is effective and ongoing environmental cleaning. And so all of the measures that we recommend for the, for the general population for social distancing, careful hygiene, all of those apply for schools. And it is a bit more challenging because the nature of the educational system to bring students together. And there are many plans to, um, to reduce class sizes, to reduce um, uh, you know, the size of gatherings as much as possible and to, to rotate schedules and, and many measures that schools can take to help them to be um, as, safe as, as safe as an environment as possible. We're going to roll one of the questions that's come in from one of our viewers in Anderson. Yeah, my name is Linda Bice and I'm from Anderson, South Carolina. Um, what I am concerned about uh, in my retirement years, I am now spending half my year at the coast, half my year uh, in the upstate. And I'm supposed to go back to the coast in October. That's when it's going to be cold again. So now I'm thinking, will the virus come back? Will they close the beaches again? Uh, will I actually be able to keep my retirement plans? What's your read on that scenario? Well, there are still so many unknowns about this virus. And the questions about how the virus will be circulating in various seasons is particularly unknown because we've only experienced several months of this now, not into the winter time. And so, um, you know, as we talked about earlier, the possibility for a resurgence does exist. And, um, you know, retirement plans, vacation plans, things like that, uh, no matter what the activity is, we just encourage people to be ever mindful of all the recommendations that we've provided about social distancing, about uh, being careful about being exposed in public without protection, without a mask, so that people can uh, participate in um, activities 
as much as possible and still protect themselves. But um, we really don't have the ability, the, the knowledge of uh, a long enough experience with this virus to make those types of predictions. So we will continue to make recommendations based on what we know about how the virus is spread from person to person to make sure that people can protect themselves as much as possible. Now a question from Pickens County. I'm Pamela Nally. I'm living currently in Pickens County. I work in Greenville. I'm a realtor for Remax Results. And um, my question is, um, you know, I want to know why this is continuing. Um, there's more people dying from the flu than there was this. And um, this is currently putting people, good people, out of business. And Dr. Bell. And your question, why this is a continuing is um, for a number of reasons. The first being that it's a respiratory virus. And respiratory viruses are, are difficult to control because of the way they're transmitted from respiratory droplets. So to control the droplets that people cough or sneeze or breathe is a challenge. Unlike other diseases that are spread by more um, close and intimate contact, if we're in an airspace with a person, uh, within a few feet for a matter of minutes and they can be exposed, then we will continue to see ongoing spread if we don't take measures to protect ourselves. And um, some other factors are that we have other abilities to control other diseases with a vaccine for the flu, for example, and other vaccine preventable diseases or medications to treat them. So in the absence of any other measures to treat or control or provide protection against this particular virus, when something is spread by respiratory droplets, then we rely entirely on people's behaviors to prevent ongoing spread. And, and we just continue to encourage that people take the known measures to prevent exposure to respiratory droplets to slow down the spread as much as possible. Dr. Linda Bell, thank you for joining us tonight. Brandon. Amy, thanks. When we come back, we will talk about our state's tourism industry, how it's been affected by this crisis. You're watching South Carolina Responds We'll be right back. Welcome back here in Charleston. Tourism, we know, is a billion dollar industry and the hit the city and its businesses have taken from this COVID-19 pandemic, well, it's staggering. With more than 40,000 food and beverage workers still out of jobs, many of you are asking us, 
how the low country is expected to bounce back. It's a good question. And tonight we're joined by Charleston Mayor John Tetlenberg. Uh, what the city's doing to get ahead on these recovery efforts. First of all, Mayor, I want to say thank you for joining us during this time. I want to talk about, first of all, how bad it's been the last three months. Reports say maybe revenue down 85 to 90 percent. What does that mean to a city like Charleston that relies on visitors? Well, Brendan, thank you for having me this evening. And there's been a significant impact to our revenue stream, particularly from accommodations, hospitality taxes, and parking revenues. We're estimating our revenues for the balance of this calendar year to be down about $42 million in those, in those areas primarily. But what's important is that we as a city and a region are going to be able to have a robust recovery because we were able to keep the numbers down in the first place. We did not become a hot spot. We do not have a stigma of having had a lot of cases. So I believe that folks will safely be able to come back to Charleston and safely be able to open up our businesses and get going again, as long as we do it in a measured way, keep an eye on the numbers, monitor things, and have the testing and contact tracing in place just in case some numbers start to rise again. Yeah, that's the big point, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg. Uh, we know that Charleston is slowly reopening, but you've talked to the food and beverage industry, the restaurants who, yes, they want to open, they want to make that money, but to do so, they need to follow strict guidelines, don't they? Well, they, they do, and they're doing so voluntarily because they realize that this isn't just a sprint. This is a marathon. We're going to uh, be back in business for years to come, and we want Charleston to be known as the safest place, the safest place to come and to open back up and to be in business, and that will lead to the most robust recovery that we can imagine. We've partnered with our health care professionals and businesses. You've probably seen our website, uh, One Region, and it's a, a broad set of guidelines for all our business sectors to, to, uh, to go by so that we do this in the safest way possible and build confidence for our citizens, for our visitors, and that's what will make us successful going forward. Mayor Tecklenburg, we've talked about your three stages of this outbreak. Of course, stage one was the shutdown. Stage two is the strategic reopening. Stage three, restoring our economy. We're basically in stage two right now, but how do you stop people from trying to go too fast too soon? Well, it's being done, uh, Brendan, in a, in a measured way, and, and we've been able to keep an eye on the numbers. And if you look at the cities and MUSCs, uh, websites that monitors and tracks key parameters in the region locally. Dr. Cole says all infections are local. So we're watching those numbers in Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester counties and monitoring those on, on a day by day basis. And things are looking good right now. We've kept the numbers down. So week by week, we've been opening more businesses step by step. We're putting uh, these new guidelines in place there's a new normal. It's not going to be flip the switch and everything back to the way it was. Uh, we're going step by step and being careful and watching the numbers. And so, yes, it will be a little different going forward, that new normal, until finally a, a great preventive uh, treatment and or vaccine are in place. But in the meantime, there's no reason as long as we monitor things that we can't get back to business and get thriving again. All right, Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg joining us, talking about uh, the strategies in place to bring tourists back to the Holy City. Mayor Tecklenburg, we certainly appreciate your time. Thank you. And as you've heard, tourism has taken quite a hit here in the Low Country, but we wanted to find out how the Myrtle Beach area is faring as well. My colleague Megan Miller joins us from there and has more. Thanks so much. And joining me now is CEO of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce, Karen Reardon. Karen, thank you so much for joining us thank this evening. Today. We are really in <laughs> unprecedented times here nationally and across South Carolina with the coronavirus.
uncharted territory. What kind of impact has the coronavirus had here in our tourism industry in South Carolina? The, the impact in March and April uh, won't be fully uh, realized for a while, but our best estimates are that we're looking at a 40% decline, uh, which is devastating uh, for our hotels, our golf courses. We are the golf capital of the world. Uh, they've only been open to local play. So uh, we're looking at a multi, multi-million dollar um, you know, devastation, and uh, May now is our first opportunity to start to see what we may be able to do to start that slow recovery. Now, with that recovery, let's talk tourism numbers. Last mm -hmm. year versus this year, what is the difference we're seeing not only here at the beach, but really across South Carolina? Uh, again, last year we had an incredible year. It was one of the top years we've had in the last decade with over 20 million people coming to the Grand Strand. Um, we can't uh, realistically expect that kind of visitation this year. Um, we know that uh, quite a few of our tourism and hospitality businesses will not survive this event. Um, we're particularly concerned about our restaurant industry, uh, as well as some of our smaller boutiques and retail, um, our hoteliers. Uh, again, we have a lot of golf courses. Um, all of those aspects of hospitality have been very hard hit. Um, so it is going to be a marathon. Uh, really, this isn't a sprint. Um, we believe it's going to take the better part of the rest of this year and most of 2021 to actually sort of come back to those visitation levels that we enjoyed in 2019. Now, the tourism industry were very special because South Carolina's economy heavily relies on tourism. Yes. Why is it so important for the tourism industry that South Carolina open up properly and to open up safely? Well, I think the, the biggest issue is just that uh, it is so important to our overall economy that we have to do it right. We have to get it right because what we can't afford is to actually have a major outbreak that happens anywhere in South Carolina, uh, God forbid, on the Grand Strand, that would actually be devastating to us um, because that would signal to all those visitors within the state and outside that we are not a safe place uh, to start to think about to return to. And so doing it in a very methodical, strategic way, um, as the governor has been sort of first closing us and now reopening the state, um, we believe has been the right way to go. What is the approach to marketing South Carolina and its tourism industry and everything that we have to offer in this beautiful state moving forward? Because a lot of our mm -hmm. target markets are those coronavirus hotspots like up north. Let's yes. say New Jersey, New mm -hmm. York, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, those areas. And we had enjoyed quite good visitation over the last couple of years. I can tell you that this year that's not going to be a focal point for us. We're really going to be very focused on the Carolinas and our, you know, our close-in states of Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, everyone is starting to recover from COVID-19. And so as people get healthier and they have that cabin fever, um, we do expect that they will start to make their way back to the Grand Strand. Everybody certainly has their fingers crossed here at South Carolina. Well, Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. I'm Megan Miller. Thanks so much for tuning in. Now back to you in the Upstate. And when we come back, we're going to hear more from the governor and State Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman will be answering your questions. You're watching South Carolina Responds, your questions answered. We'll be right back.
South Carolina Responds. Your questions answered continues now. And good evening. We're glad you're with us. We hope we've gotten to many of your questions so far. If not, there's still many more to go. Taking your questions to our state and federal leaders and with more of his sit down interview with the governor, let's go back to Brendan. Brendan. Gordon, thank you. As I continue my one on one conversation with Governor Henry McMaster, we really hit on the hundreds of thousands of South Carolinians who have lost their jobs because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Many even months after applying, still not receiving their benefits. All of the states at the same time have not been swamped with unemployment insurance claims like this. So there was a bottleneck for sure. And we did everything we could here in South Carolina to work around it, including getting them to revamp and strengthen that uh, uh, computer, the Social Security. So it's, it's running smoothly now, but for a while we, we, had, we went from 29 people answering the phone for unemployment claims up to, I think it's about 600 now. So what would you say your advice to these people who it's been two months without a paycheck or without any money? Keep knocking, keep calling. Yeah. Get on that, get on that, because your, your request, your application will be taken and will be processed. As far as education, the governor acknowledging it's vital to get students back into the classroom at every level. He says virtual learning has worked better than expected, but it wasn't available to everyone. These schools are ready to open back up. The universities uh, especially, or what, what I'm, I'm hearing is they want to start back up in the fall that they may have uh, some limits on them. They may uh, provide uh, some new, new types of, of situations, a lot of uh, distant learning and those sorts of things. But uh, they are, it takes that tuition money to run a school. And if they don't have students, they have to start cutting back. I imagine there's gonna be a lot of cutting back. But from what I, my, in, in my conversations with the schools, it's clear to me that they, they realize that this is a dangerous situation and they are taking steps to see that social distancing is practiced and that the students and the faculty and the staffs are not put into untenable situations. We keep going like we're going right now as far as high school, elementary, and middle school. You think kids will be back in the classroom this August? I hope so, but yeah. that, re that remains to be seen. I know that is the goal that the educators would like to accomplish. Whether we're able to do that will depend on a lot of things between now and then. A real concern by the governor and his administration, a second wave along with severe weather. We saw deadly tornadoes throughout the state back in April. Hurricane season begins June 1st. I'll say this, with tornadoes, with hurricanes, with this uh, virus, our team in South Carolina, the response team from the National Guard to the epidemiologists to the county organizations to uh, to the emergency management division in FEMA and all that. We're about as practiced and rehearsed as we could possibly be, uh, but we, we don't need any more right now. We, we want to get out of this virus smartly, and it's going to take a long time to do that. Uh, we've had a lot of tornadoes. I hope we don't have any more. Hurricane season is starting a little early this year, it appears, but uh, we're, the, the people of our state and the uh, the camaraderie and the relationships and the communications that have developed among the mayors, the legislators, uh, the, the uh, police, uh, the educators that have developed over the years is a very welcome thing uh, in our state. And I'm very proud of our people. And proud of our health care workers who the governor says are responsible for saving thousands of lives. People are exhausted and that's why they, they want to get outside. They want to walk around. They're ready to go back to work. But again, we got to manage this so we can do those things. We go go out gradually. We go we go calculate and measure the results as we go, like just as we did going in. And but, but we must understand that however good things are looking, that virus is still here. And if we let our guard down, we could be right back in it even worse than we were before. We don't want that to happen. And after our conversation, Governor McMaster, he signed a more than $155 million COVID-19 relief package that will help provide statewide virus testing and keep the state's government operated until the fall. Now let's head back up to Greenville where Amy Wood is sitting down with the state superintendent, Amy. That's right. There's so many questions surrounding schools and what's going to happen with the break in education, what it means in the long run, and what school looks like next fall. Whether you are a parent, a student, or a teacher, 
Boy, have we heard from you. Joining us live right now from Columbia via Zoom is our state superintendent of education, Molly Spearman. And I'm going to start off with Lisa Alvarez's question, uh, Mrs. Spearman, asking what are we going to do if somebody tests positive during the school year? Does the whole school have to go into isolation for 14 days? How will this play out in situation after situation? <laughs> Well, thank you for having me on tonight and a special thank you to all the teachers and for the extraordinary job they've done and to parents for being our partners throughout this pandemic, grandparents too. Uh, Lisa, that's a great question. We will be following the guidelines of the CDC uh, and also with our own state DHEC as to how to handle that. There's some variance that's happening now as far as should you stay home 10 days if you've been infected or is it seven days, but we'll be following whatever guideline is in place by our health experts uh, in DHEC and CDC. But when you get into those scenarios of having to isolate or quarantine kids in class after class, you get in those grade levels where kids are moving classroom to classroom, it seems like it would be extremely debilitating for any one school to go through something like that. Well, it would be, and that's why we're going to be doing everything possible that we can to make sure that there's a safe environment. The health of our students and teachers will be the number one priority. Obviously, we want to get back to school as normal as possible, but we have already ordered the protective equipment so that all of our teachers will be protective so that the schools will have the supply of disinfectant, the protocols in place to keep school just as safe as possible. We have a task force called Accelerate Education. Uh, that's meeting. They're giving me advice on how to proceed and they're looking at those daily operations and the best practices that we know about all over the country. And we'll certainly put all of those practices in place here in South Carolina. Teachers are asking, Mrs. Spearman, are they getting raises this year? Are you recommending <laughs> that they get raises? They are very concerned about this. Yeah, well, you know, and, and the sad thing is we were on the break of about uh, of having the most uh, historic raise for teachers in the history of South Carolina uh, that was passed in the House budget. And certainly things have changed tremendously since that happened. Uh, we will begin the school year under a continuing resolution, which means we'll be operating schools on the same amount of money that was appropriated last year. So there's no raise at the beginning of the year for teachers, even the step increase will be frozen until the legislature can come back into session in September. At that point, they'll have a better view of what the revenue has been collected and uh, know how we stand. And at that point, hopefully there will be some money there that we can do a raise, but obviously I cannot predict that. I was one of the biggest advocates for a teacher pay raise, but now we're in the reality of a uh, economic system that has been hit very, very drastically. So we'll just have to wait and see how those tax collections come in. And when the legislature comes back into session in September. What about having six extra days? We keep hearing the task forces discussing that. Right. Well, we think it's really important to have some extra time with our students. We're not only asking for those six extra days, which would be used for instruction, but also for diagnostic assessments, academic assessments, spending time with emotional, social assessments, working with our students. And then, of course, we're also asking for funding to have an expanded summer school for those students in kindergarten through third grade who are not on grade level. And they were not on grade level on March 13th. So knowing that and with the summer uh, slide that usually happens when students are out of school, we know that they really do need to get back with an adult. It's great to have virtual. It works well in many cases, but there's nothing like a certified teacher sitting beside or at least six feet away from a student to teach them how to read and be on grade level. So we're trying to uh, have that happen in July. It would be a four week summer camp for reading and math, kindergarten through third graders. Tiffany Prescott asking, will parents and teachers be expected to provide hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies with all that's gonna be required to keep the classrooms yeah. safe? 
Well, we're ordering that and uh, we have money appropriated through the CARES Act that will be used to make sure we have cleaning supplies on hand, that we purchase the type sprayers that will be needed to disinfect the classrooms and that we'll have plenty of hand sanitizer on, on hand for students to use. Now, I'm sure we'll always accept uh, donations from parents, but we feel, feel that it is our responsibility to purchase that uh, those supplies and have them readily available for all classrooms in the state. Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman, thank you for making time for us tonight. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Senator Tim Scott, and we're talking business with the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce. Stay with us. Welcome back to this COVID-19 Town Hall special. We are getting your questions answered tonight, and we are joined right now live from the nation's capital by Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. So thank you so much for joining us, Senator. Thank you, ma'am. It's good to be here with you. Thank you. We have a lot of folks asking day after day about their stimulus checks. One of our callers to the newsroom said, I know some people still haven't received their checks and won't receive their checks. Will the IRS send those people a letter to tell them they won't get a check so we can stop wondering? Well, I think the first thing to realize is that the IRS has sent out about 130 million checks so far. If you have any questions about whether or not you're going to receive a check, I'd recommend going to Google and Googling IRS get my check. That is the easiest, simplest way to figure out when your check is coming and if your check is coming. If you made less than $75,000 in 2018 or 2019, you are eligible for a check if you're an adult. So it's kind of that simple. If you made more than 75,000, then it, it, it it's, uh, grades down until you hit $99,000. Said differently, someone gets a check under $99,000, you get $1,200 under 75,000. Following up on the question we were asking Senator Graham, do you believe the Senate should indeed come up with more money to help out Americans and South Carolinians in particular? And will you support that kind of legislation? I think a really important uh, way to start the ans answering that question is to realize that what Congress has done so far is approved around almost $3 trillion in stability funding in multiple channels. All of the money has not gone out yet, so it's hard for me to predict the future not, re not knowing the impact and the effectiveness of the current $3 trillion. In addition to that, the Treasury Department and the uh, Federal Reserve 
they are going through the process of setting up an additional funding source through small loans to uh, mid-sized businesses and larger. So that $450 billion that we gave to the Treasury to set up these uh, resources, that actually should be multiplied by eight. So it's another th two and a half to three and a half trillion dollars, depending on how, how the financial institutions use it. So that's a, a lot of resources that we cannot tell you how it's impacted the economy. So it'll be a little longer before we should anticipate what the next step should be. So you're not giving a yes on that just yet? Well, it's kind of hard to give you a yes when, in fact, yeah. we don't know what's happened to $3 trillion direct appropriations and an additional $3 trillion that hasn't even hit the market yet. So for me to say, yes, we should spend more money when we have no clue what the last $3 trillion has done and what the first $3 trillion has impacted, it's kind of uh, uh, disingenuous for me to give you an answer that I don't have. Got it. All right, we go to a question from one of our viewers from Easley. Yes, ma'am. My name's Victoria Boltman, and I'm from Easley. And I would li like to ask Tim Scott, what about getting more testing out here in Greenville County and Pickens County? It's really important for us. And Senator, you spent some time talking about rural South Carolina and minority communities. Talk a little bit about how we get the testing moving out to areas that are being neglected. Yes, ma'am. One of the things I focused on and, and even new legislation that I have coming up right now has to focus on providing more tests for our nursing home, our senior population. And frankly, as I said today in a hearing and I said last week in another hearing, it's really important to us, for us to get testing out into rural America. And specifically, I spoke about rural South Carolina. So the good news is the governor is making the right decisions as it relates to our senior population, testing all 40,000 residents in our nursing homes. Between now and the end of June, 220,000 South Carolina residents will be tested. 60,000 have been tested so far uh, this month, only this month. So uh, we're heading in the right direction. We can't get there fast enough for me. And uh, according to the, the young lady from Easley, can't get there fast enough for her either. The good news is it's coming and we have a target that ends June 30th. But even after June 30th, we anticipate higher levels of testing. And that's really good news for South Carolina. And we will, of course, appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for being here to take these questions from our viewers. Senator, we appreciate it. Gordon? Thank you. Let's talk yes, more about business here. We've got the economic impact, how it affects small businesses, and all of us who draw a paycheck or who desperately need one right now. From Columbia, we're joined by Ted Pitts. He's the CEO of the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Pitts, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with uh, these businesses around South Carolina. Every industry has been hit hard by this, some much harder than others. As the chamber, do you have a sense of how many businesses in this state will not survive? What's happening now? Yeah, so we don't have a sense of how many will not survive. I will tell you that a lot of industry across all sectors has been hit really hard. You know, our tourism and um, accommodations industry has been hit the hardest, followed by manufacturers who, who've had to shut down for a short period of time. Um, and then healthcare, you know, we talk about hospitals. We've cleaned out the hospitals in anticipation for a surge, and those hospitals have stopped doing elective surgeries. Most of them have started back as of now. Um, but you look at those sort of industries across the state, employ a lot of people, and, and have all been impacted. And do you have a sense of how long it will take before many of the people who were either temporarily furloughed from their job or laid off entirely can be called back? I mean, even when everything is fully open, not everyone is fully up and ramped up to speed at this point. Yeah, so we did a survey in concert with the governor and the Department of Commerce and the Accelerate SC Task Force. We did a survey of about 4,500 businesses around the state. Um, and. 42% of those businesses said they had already laid off people or furloughed employees. And then when you ask a follow-up question of how many of those businesses that had laid off or furloughed employees expected to be able to bring 100% of those folks back um, within 90 days, um, about 43% of them said they would not be able to do that. So I think the concern is, is that we've been pushed into a recession with the, the measures that we've had to take to fight the virus and to flatten the curve. Um, and we've got to get uh, 
the economy moving again so these businesses can get back on their feet and, and try to get back to some sense of normalcy. It, normalcy may be a while by, by a number of different measures, but we had the governor during this broadcast say that the state economy will be ramped back up by June. We've had other political leaders say it's going to come roaring back perhaps by the end of the year. How long do you think it will take before business activity is where it was last year? So I think it's going to be a while before business activity is where it was last year. But I do think the governor and, and policymakers that are talking about um, June time frame of having things ramp back up is true. So, you know, the businesses I talk with, whether it's a manufacturer or a restaurant or an insurance company, you know, I think they're looking at June as a target on when they can get back to some sense of normalcy. But let's be clear, that normalcy is not going to be like it was in January or February. Um, you know, we have, we have purposely slowed the economy down as we forced people um, to social distance and stay at home if they could. Um, you know, what I would say is that South Carolina, I talked to my colleagues from around the country, we've had the best stay at home or work order that, that anybody's had in the country. And I think South Carolina's economy will come out of this faster than many other states because of that approach. We really didn't shut folks down. Um, we took some high risk high contact businesses and we forced them to close, but many businesses stayed open on some level, even if it wasn't at 100%. All right, I want to take a question from a viewer about those businesses that are reopening. Listen to this. Hi, my name is Caroline and I'm calling from St. George. Um, one of the things that my family is a little bit concerned about is business reopening without any standard safety procedures. So for instance, you might go into a store and find half of the employees wearing a mask, the other half not. Is there any way that South Carolina can develop a statewide system similar to the Greater Greenville Pledge so that businesses that are opening across the state will be able to operate with public safety in mind? Mr. Pitts, can you answer that in 30 seconds? So, yeah, so I would tell you that one of the most beneficial things Accelerate SC has done is it, it has created guidelines, not a mandate, not a government mandate, but guidelines that businesses can follow to safely reopen. These guidelines were developed off the CDC guidelines, the DHEC input. So the Department of Commerce is leading that effort. I would um, encourage you to go to accelerate.sc.gov to, um, to look at those guidelines. And I think you're going to see businesses who want to keep their employees, customers, both of those um, groups safe. I think you're going to see them respond to kind of the community right. demand that, that they continue to want to shop, but they want to be safe. So. I think those guidelines are being developed, and we're hopeful that they're, they're a help to businesses across the state. We do appreciate your time this evening. That's Ted Pitts, the CEO of the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce. Your local Next Star Station's website, and we appreciate all of you joining us tonight.